Welcome to my refrigerator. This is Megan Martins Hayworth, your host for Art Fridge Art History. Today we're going to be talking about Paris Street Rainy Day by Gustav Kaibot. Welcome to the fifth episode of Art Fridge Art History with Megan Martins Hayworth. Today we're going to look at Paris Street Rainy Day by Gustav Kaibot. This is Paris Street Rainy Day, the largest painting ever painted by Gustav Kaibot. It is an oil painting on canvas painted in 1877 and it measures 6 feet 11 inches by 9 feet 1. He showed this grand painting at the Third Impressionist exhibit in 1877 where it received quite a bit of attention. You might say it stole the show. He was one of the most enthusiastic supporters and collectors of the Impressionists he showed with. But his painting really isn't impressionistic in style, not always at least. As an artist, he was a bit of an artistic chameleon. He's hard to categorize because he was an impressionist by association, but not necessarily by style. His work often jumped back and forth between the styles of impressionism and realism, which were the dominant styles in France at the time. He was from a very upper class Parisian family. His family had made their wealth selling textiles to the military for things like uniforms, and um, it paid off handsomely. His education was in engineering, and then he would go on to get a law degree and was licensed to practice law. He was also a war veteran, having fought in the Franco-Prussian War from 1870 to 1871. But after the war, he began studying painting, and he would go to the studio of painter Leon Bonat to get his training. During that time, he set up his first studio in his parents' brand new home. And in 1873, he would enter the École des Beaux-Arts uh, for a short time in Paris. When he was just 26, his father died, and he and his brothers inherited their wealth, including their family vacation home in Yer. France, which was south of Paris. It was the location of many of Kaibot's paintings. The brothers would eventually have to sell this country estate and purchase another country home north of Paris. Here you can see uh, a painting done in Yer of his brother Marshall under their orange trees. Um, there was large gardens there. In fact, this is the Angerie at their estate, which was recently restored. And even though the family sold it, it was stored, and Kaibot's family is given credit for it, basically. But you can see those very orange trees, if you look closely at the, the orangerie, um, in pots still there. And so that painting was done right there of his brother Marshall. Anyway, <laughs> Kaibot's inheritance allowed him to paint without having to worry about selling his work, which is a rare luxury that most artists don't get to enjoy. They kind of sometimes have to take on commissions, and Kaibot did not. It also allowed him to collect and purchase and become one of the greatest patrons of his fellow Impressionists. His career as an artist and role as a patron won him friendships with other artists like Edgar Degas, Claude Monet, Auguste Renoir, and others. In 1874, he would attend the first Impressionist exhibit to see the works of his friends. And three years later, he would debut eight of his own paintings at the second Impressionist exhibit in 1876. This included one of his most famous paintings. We'll talk about that in just a moment. This is where the um, first Impressionist exhibit was held. It was in the studio of a photographer named Nadar on the Boulevard des Capuchins. And they healed it in his beautiful, well-lit studio. And uh, it was on one of the most desirable uh, streets in Paris. And unfortunately, the show didn't go so well. <laughs> the Impressionists were criticized heavily. But um, he would eventually show with them. This is one of his most famous early works, one that was in that exhibit of the uh, second Impressionists exhibit. And this was called the Floor Scrapers, which created a bit of a scandal because it was considered vulgar. Um, 
the vulgarity came from showing the working class, these laborers working. Um, in fact, it was considered so vulgar that a year before, this painting that he had entered into the Salon de Paris was rejected in 1875. So he went ahead and showed it with the Impressionists. <laughs> he painted many works of his family and friends, but the subjects of his best-known works are usually the urban Parisian scenes. I wanted to show you one of his family paintings. It's also in that Angerie, that area in Nier. And these are like some of his cousins and female relatives, one of their friends, um, there in the garden um, resting. And you can tell it's the same garden because of those yellow chairs. Anyway, he did many, many portraits of his friends and family. But what got him the most recognition were typically these urban scenes. They featured the so-called New Paris. These paintings would focus on the wide boulevards that were part of Baron Haussmann's decades-long renovation of Paris. And they would feature things like these, you know, cast iron bridges and industrial structures that talked about the modernization of Paris. And our painting is one of those. Paris Street, Rainy Day, shows a brand new street corner on the Place de Dublin, then known as the Carrefour de Moscow at the intersection to the east of the Gare Saint-Lazare in northern Paris, which was near his father's brand new town home. Kaibot did several studies of this intersection and worked on the straight-lined perspective of the new and widened avenues with the precision of his engineer's eyes. You can see here a modern photograph lined up pretty much exactly to Kaibot's study which was, again, very severe, and perspective was very uh, clean and straight. Odd angles and wide points of view were his signature. They make him unique. His use of varying perspective was unique amongst his peers. Scholars attribute this to his interest in photography and the up-tilted planes that we see in Japanese prints that were in, being imported to Europe at that time. They were all the rage and artists were heavily influenced by them and no doubt Kaibot was as well. This painting leads more towards the style of realism than it does Impressionism, although it was shown with the Impressionist's work. It's realist because of its flat colors and restrained brushwork and its truth. That flat quality of light on this gray day after a rain also reflects the optical reality of what it sees and it looks accurate and therefore it's associated more with the realists than with the impressionists. Kaibot would eventually leave Paris for the town called Petit Janvier and I want to show you where that is. So this is central Paris. You can see the Eiffel Tower, Musée Rodin, the Arc de Triomphe and at the bend of the river by Argentui was this area. Now you can see today that it is actually heavily industrialized. You can see that it's a port. But at the time it was plains, fields, <laughs> across from a popular holiday location on the Seine where boating regattas and things like that occurred. So he buys this property with his brothers and they start to buy up all the property around. And pretty soon they have a pretty decent estate on the river across from Argentui. It was just north of central Paris, as you can see. And he basically stopped showing his work after he moved out of Paris at the age of 34. He was an avid gardener. And he would expand the gardens, which you can see here in the foreground of this painting of his home there. And um, he spent hours tending his garden and writing detailed letters with Claude Monet about the irrigation systems and his greenhouses, which you see him in here. He would also apply his skills to building and racing yachts. He was actually quite the sailor. And um, his home became a really popular spot for artists, friends to visit, Kaibot. And he would host Renoir and Monet, and, and 
any of the Impressionists that wanted to visit him. He was really interested in the landscape by the River Seine out there in Janvier. Um, so you can see here the yellow fields, the river at Argentui just across from his home. And they would spend hours corresponding, staying up and visiting when they would come to visit. He and Renoir became very, very close friends. He and Monet as well, but Renoir especially. And Renoir would become the executor of his will, and Kaibot was the godfather of Renoir's son. So they were very, very close. In fact, Renoir actually paints a portrait of Gustave Kaibot in his incredibly famous Luncheon of the Boating Party. You can see him there. So they were really good friends. Kaiba, unfortunately, didn't live a long life. In 1894, he died of a pulmonary edema, or a stroke, at the age of 45, and left his friend Renoir the executor of his will. His death was a blow to his fellow artists, whom he had financially supported for years. He would help them out by purchasing their works, especially when they were in dire financial straits. In fact, he would pay the rent on Claude Monet's studio for years. Kaibot's legacy as a patron is arguably more important than his legacy as a painter. He purchased his first Monet in 1875 when Monet was struggling terribly. It was a life-changing moment for Claude Monet. Kaibot heavily collected the Impressionists before their works were popular and would champion them. He ignored artists like Georges Seurat and some of the symbolists. And before his death, he was a champion of these artists and played an important role in helping his friend Claude Monet persuade the French state to purchase the late Edouard Manet's painting, Olympia. After Kaibot's death, Auguste Renoir attempted to carry out his last wishes. Kaibot wanted his collection of Impressionist art to be seen, and his desire was expressed in his will. The terms set forth in his will would frustrate Renoir for years. Kaibot left his collection of 68 Impressionist paintings to the French state, but he had stipulated that they be put on display in the Luxembourg Palace, where um, modern painters were displayed instead of some provincial museums in backwater, you know, French cities. He wanted them to be featured up front and center in Paris. And then later he wanted them to go on display at the Louvre. Unfortunately, because the Impressionists didn't enjoy the popularity that they enjoy today, these terms were unacceptable to France, and they said no. They said no to 19 Pizarros, 14 Monets, 10 Renoirs, 9 Sicilies, 7 Degas, 5 Cezannes, and 4 Manets. <laughs> I have to laugh. Yet, Renoir persisted. And finally, in 1896, the French state accepted only 38 of the 68 paintings in his collection. And they would put them on display at the Luxembourg Palace, which was the first time an exhibit of the Impressionists had been put on display in a public venue that was sponsored by the state. And then there were 30 left. 30 paintings of Kaibot's collection needed a home. Renoir took one, a Degas, in payment for executing the will. And he kept offering the remaining 29 paintings to the French government. He offered them twice more, once in 1904 and again in 1908. And the French state refused him twice more. So Renoir basically was forced to give up and returned the remaining 29 paintings to Kaibot's family. Then, in an M. Night Shyamalanian twist, 20 years after they said no to those 29 paintings, the French government came back to claim them from Kaibot's estate, his relatives. By then, Kaibot's sister-in-law, who was over it, 
said no. She said, nope, we're going to remain in possession of these paintings and told them that the family was going to keep them. Eventually, his family would sell off most of that collection, and some of them do end up in the property of France, but they didn't really sell Kaibot's work until much, much later. Remember, it was probably pretty sentimental for them. Kaibot was virtually unknown in the United States until his family sold those paintings in the 1950s. Because remember, he didn't necessarily have to sell his work, so his family had most of them. This painting, Paris Street, was sold to American collectors by the last name of Chrysler. And it was finally then purchased by the Art Institute of Chicago in 1964 for an undisclosed amount of money. And he became a well-known painter here. In 2000, his painting, Man on a Balcony, Boulevard Houseman, which you see here, 1880, sold for more than $14.3 million in 2000. And Young Man at His Window sold for $53 million. Today, a total of 40 of his collection of the Impressionists are on display in the famous Musée d'Orsay in Paris. And so we are lucky indeed that he could afford to paint what he wanted to paint and spend his money on his fellow artists' work. Who knows where their work would stand today um, in the art history you know, timeline without his patronage and championship, his promotion of this movement and these artists that were his friends and his fellows. Finally, I leave you with a painting of his that I really love called Sunflowers Along the Seine. And I'm showing you this in acknowledgement of Ukraine and their suffering and their struggles today at the hands of Russia. Just a little tribute to them, a very beautiful painting. Thank you for joining me today for Art Fridge Art History. My daughter would like to ask you something. Hit that subscribe button, comment, wink, and like my mom's face. She was totally dying to do that. Anyway, if you like what you are hearing, please subscribe. Thank you again. We'll see you next time.